Quazzo, and I'm actually an investment banker by trade. Um, I spend about 50% of my time, and I have for the last decade, in the not-for-profit education segment, and about 50% of my time in the for-profit um, education segment. In both sides of that proverbial aisle, I am actually working with entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, I'm happy to report that entrepreneurs and innovators exist in both sides, which is excellent. Um, and, it, and what's fascinating to me on this topic of scale and spread, and spread for me, the way I, defi I define spread is efficacy and engagement. Um, everyone out there is looking very hard at the issues around efficacy, and they are very much linked to engagement, particularly with the dynamics going on in our current social networking world. So whether it's a charter school operator or the Chicago Public School Charter um, Network Group, Renaissance Schools, or whether it's the CEO of a startup uh, technology company in education, everyone is talking about efficacy and scale. Um, so the reason I titled my my, my speech where my present my story uh, what I did uh, as an investment banker stories are a little alien to me but um, is is that I think that we can all agree and I'm, I know I'm totally preaching to the choir here that um, the litany of statistics around the sorry state of American education today it's just really shocking that we haven't all been jolted uh, into realizing that we have to embrace innovation now and I think there are a lot of us out here um, who are you know who understand this but there are a lot who don't Again, we all know the story, um, the, the horrific list of statistics, the 30% national dropout rate. I spent a lot of time with a group called America's Promise. That is our singular focus, is attention around the dropout rate. 50% plus rates, dropout rates in urban cities. Um, my hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, less than 30% of African American males graduate from high school. My adopted hometown of Chicago, we have a 44% dropout rate, which yields an annual at-risk population on the streets of 100,000 youth. Uh, we have 2,000, as we all know, uh, dropout factories spread out all over the country. And while, you know, in the, in the statistical rankings, while students of wealthier countries uh, typically perform on average much better than developing countries on the OECD global standardized test rankings, um, the U.S., is, as you, many of you likely know, does not even show up in the rankings of the top 25 of OECD countries in math, science, or reading. Um, I think the question is, do you need a double espresso or a double martini after you go through those? <laughs> but um, with, my, with my, my thoughts here, I'm going to walk through a little bit of a story. But I think we do see green shoots. I think this conference is evidence of the green shoots. I wandered around the rooms while y'all were eating lunch, and I was very provoked by what you all had, on, had done on the walls. Um, but it certainly is hard for me to conclude anything except that we really do need a double espresso for education. And, Sorry, I'm not used to courting two things at one time. Um, we, um, and I think the, it, it, back to the original topic, it's critical that we are developing scaled solutions that deliver engagement and efficacy, whether those are online, technology, or site-based. And like this very highly caffeinated little man, who reminds me of myself, I guess, um, we really need to do it all right now. The sense of urgency has never been greater, and it has to be done. So from my end, um, it's clear to me in looking at some of the, at some of the things that are going on out there in, in um, all aspects of the education marketplace, it is time that we got out of the proverbial box um, and began to think a little bit differently about things. So where I'd like to actually start my story is in South Korea. <laughs> South Korea is a country that you, you may know actually ranks incredibly well in the OECD rankings. They're 11th in science, they're fourth in math, is South Korea, and they're first in reading um, and the most recent tests. They actually spend about 6% of GDP on, on public education, which is relatively comparable to the U.S. We're at about 5.4. Um, and despite those very positive outcomes, the general population has a high distrust of the public education system. Um, and they do view the priority of educational outcomes as critically, critically important and very, very high stakes. So as a result, an additional 2.2% of GDP is actually spent by consumers on private education solutions, including the infamous or famous or whatever you wish to call them, cram schools that um, most of the population in South Korea participates in. The story that I'm going to tell is about an entrepreneur named Sun Ju Yuen, who from now on I'm calling Mr. Sun, um, who in the 1990s was a very successful tutor uh, in, one of the, in one of the cram school organizations. He had been a tutor for 14 years. He was making, yes, this is true, over $570,000 a year as a tutor in a cram school. 
but he wasn't satisfied. I think he was most discouraged by the fact that the cram schools were increasingly, logically, if you're making 570,000 a year, increasingly oriented to the wealthy um, elements of the population, and they were not serving the broader population of South Koreans, so poor children were not getting access to the, the, the best schools and the best education and that sort of thing. So one day in 1999, while he was watching Home Shopping Network remarkably, he actually invented a company called Megastudy. The idea was really simple. Uh, it's remarkable to me, I actually go out and I talk to venture capitalists and investors and things like that, and actually it's remarkable to me how few people have actually heard of this business, but it was very simple. The original idea was to create an affordable online test prep company where it would be available to students anytime, anywhere. Originally focused on that, that cohort of students trying to get into the very best colleges and universities in, in South Korea. It grew from that to become much broader. It became, he began to define it as an honest, inexpensive education available to everyone. And that word honest is an interesting insert of his, um, in, indicative of perhaps the general mistrust of around the public school system. Um, he began to leverage, and that so it went from this, this college prep business into, is now actually very much oriented in what I would call K to gray, uh, a lifelong learning, although still um, highly concentrated in the college piece. He leveraged the experts, who are the experts, teachers, lecturers, and he has them actually compete to be the very best um, based on engagement and results. Uh, and for that, they're very handsomely rewarded. Teachers and lecturers take home about 23% of the revenue that they generate. I'm not saying that money's the answer. I think we all know it's not, but it's interesting. Uh, he leveraged the web to scale um, so teachers can have almost unlimited students. So as teachers are interacting with students, but they're using a web environment so they can really control what their, you know, their own demand supply uh, dynamics look like. He also leveraged the web to make it affordable. A class, he created, you know, he created, he democratized the, the process and created access. A class costs only $30 to $40 a course. He created accountability. The web, of course, creates incredible transparency. You can rate the teachers. You can, you know, so the people who are getting the best results and the best ratings, therefore, um, get the highest demand and it becomes a virtuous circle. Um, and, and <laughs> wait till we get to the part about how teachers are reacted to in the system. Uh, he really shifted the power to the consumer, the student and the parent. They began to be able to, to pick how they wanted to allocate their dollars and how they wanted to, to fulfill their own education. And he, and he created, he, he made the teacher or the lecturer a standalone entrepreneur focused on delivering engagement and efficacy to students. Um, less than 10 years later, the results are really quite staggering. Uh, Mega Study today has over 2.8 million student subscribers in just South Korea. That is actually over half of all college bound high school students in South Korea. His scale, you know, and actually beyond that, he has in the entire high school, he just launched his high school business. He has now has 22% of all high schoolers. He has 5% of middle schoolers, and he's just gone into elementary and adult to provide online education. Um, he has basically, the scale has driven, uh, was driven by the democratized access, the low price point, and the efficacy of the model itself. The model logically had inherent network effects. If your buddy was taking from Megastudy and he was moving ahead of you in class, you sure as heck are going to get on Megastudy to become, you know, be in there with your buddy. So the network has continued to grow and grow. And some competitors have also arisen naturally. Um, spread or efficacy in this context is pretty easy to measure. Uh, kids get into college or they don't. Uh, they do better in school or they don't. Um, interestingly, Mr. Sun took the company public for, I know this is not, this is, y'all are not all, all stock pickers here, but he did take the public in, uh, company public in 2000. Um, and today this company actually has a market capitalization of $1.35 billion. They have revenues of over $200 million. Again, it's not all about money, but it is, it is fascinating the kinds of dynamics this has created. I think even more remarkable, and I think, um, the part that I love the best is that the great, the best lecturers in the system make in excess of a million dollars. Uh, and in fact, the highest performing lecturer this year at Mega Study, who was a teacher, um, made north of two million dollars. Um, just you know, based on the success of the teaching, individuals clamor for these jobs. It's very competitive. If you don't perform, you, you know, you, your contract is taken away. 
And, and they have, and, and when you read through the material, they will have these auditorium sessions where students and parents come for the superstar teachers and literally get autographs of the superstar teachers because they're so idolized within the overall society. What an amazing thing that we'd all be wanting to get the autographs of our teachers. Wouldn't that be extraordinary? Um, just awesome. So I, you know, I think the, the, and Mr. Sun, his prediction actually today as he sits here looking back on the 10 year evolution of the business is that um, offline schools will become, become supplemental to online education in South Korea, meaning that they will become the place where kids socialize, they do sports, they do extracurriculars and that sort of thing. And that's the vision he sees and, and based on kind of what's happened here, you would have to, you'd, you'd hate to bet against him. So as I sit here, I think, you know, I ponder whether you imagine a world in the United States where students and parents or, you know, are the, the quote consumer are in the driver's seat, uh, where learning efficacy is really at the forefront of our society's concern, where students respond like this, and this is literally what, this is not, obviously not an accurate, not a literal picture from South Korea, or I'd be really mixed up, but, um, but, uh, but this, I mean, you should see what happens when these rock star teachers show up and the kids, and the kids want to see them get their autographs. So this, so when students respond like this, and not like this, <laughs> and where teachers are really elevated to rock star status and paid accordingly. Um, and wouldn't that be really a wonderful vision where we really did all, we're able to take our, our, our society, invert our society, and, and Lady Gaga was a, was a great teacher at uh, Mega Study USA. So I guess with my, my final note is that there, there really are, um, th this whole move towards scale and efficacy and engagement, I'm not sure Mega Study is the, the answer here but I, for the United States, but I think it's a fascinating dynamic to think about elevating the power of the consumer and the power of the teacher within our systems and the kind of change that can make. And what I will say is a person who spends most of her time or a lot of her time raising money and representing young entrepreneurial companies who are all very mission driven in their desire to help change education. There are a lot of, of companies out there um, seeking to, to, to drive that sort of change. I saw on the walls there are a lot of discussion around platform. There are a lot of fascinating platform companies out there. Um, and I think one of the dynamics we need to change is that um, uh, what we see in the venture capital community is a real reticence when, you, when the word education comes out of your mouth, everybody cr you know, cringes like this, oh no, you know, because you can't make money in education. And I think if we all want to help facilitate this drive towards innovation and scale and platform and, tech, you know, and technology driven solutions, we need some solutions around how we can tr change this impression of the, uh, of the education landscape as a place that's hostile to innovation and actually one that's welcoming of innovation. Um, and on a final note, I will say that, you know, I did have many exceptional teachers in my career. I was very pri privileged by that. Um, not, you know, as far as I know, none became rock stars, but this is as close as I ever got to a rock star. So <laughs> with that, thank you guys very much. Thank you.